Hi, I'm Johnny from Akashic Books, and I am so happy today to be speaking with Maza Mangiste, whose latest novel, The Shadow King, has just been longlisted for the Booker Prize. Congratulations, Maza. That's incredible news. Thank you, Johnny. I was I, I was really stunned to hear the news. Um, and it was good to get some positive news after so many, so many months of gloom. Where have you been living since the virus set in? And where were you when the protests broke out over the murder of George Floyd? I was in Zurich um, prior to the pandemic on a fellowship that was last that lasted until June. So when the pandemic uh, broke out, I was there. I had been traveling back and forth uh, between Zurich and London and Brussels. And just before the pandemic broke out, I was in London and my husband had flown there to meet me. And as he was, as we were leaving and he was on his way back to New York, he said, this is going to get really bad. We were just hearing the rumblings of shutdowns and a possible global fear, but nobody thought it would be the way it, you know, the way it is now. Um, but I went back to Zurich and within, I think, a week, I was in lockdown. And, and then the U.S. went into lockdown and I stayed in Zurich. So I was there for the, pen, for the protests. Um, protests happened in Zurich, too. And it was happening across um, across Europe, but in Zurich, um, it it didn't happen, of course, at the same time as the United States. But when it happened, I put on my face mask and I joined the crowds. And it was um, I wanted to do something, even from where I was. And it was an incredible experience. Um, number one, to see so many people out and to see so many people of color. And the, our march went, began on this street called Bahnhofstrasse, which is the most expensive street in Europe, if not the world, because of all of the high-end stores that are there. It, it is the most expensive. And the protest started there and then wove its way into immigrant communities saying Black Lives Matter. And that was so moving for me. And to see all of these African immigrants, African residents of Zurich, the Bangladeshi, also the you know East Asians, people from different worlds who live in those communities step out. Some of them, Johnny, were banging with their pants as we were going by. And prostitution, sex work is legal in, in Switzerland. And so all of these sex workers came out in support of us. And I realized that's something that we would not necessarily see here in the US, but they, they, were, they came out in support and that was amazing. Akashic has just published an anthology of brand new stories that you edited called Addis Ababa Noir. When putting the book together, how important to you was it to include writers still living in Ethiopia? Uh -huh. That was really important, Johnny. I don't know if you remember how many years ago it was when we first sat down at a cafe and started talking. <laughs> I do. Started talking about how could this. I not remember how long ago that was, Maza? <laughs> I get it. I get it. <laughs> so um, it was, you know, that was the main thing. It's how can we how can we use this anthology how, uh, to to become a bridge between those talented writers, the talent that's in Ethiopia, and an audience that's not only in the West, but I, I've been really um, excited by the fact that you and I are in conversation about possible distribution also across Africa. And so to have these writers known both in the West and also on the continent is, um, is for me a dream come true. And so I wanted, I wanted a, a solid number of writers who were still living in Ethiopia because I knew that they existed. And I, um, I wanted to make sure that I could, I found them if I didn't know them already, um, that I learned of more and, and began to, to be a champion of, of these really exciting voices. In the introduction to the anthology, you write, there are men who live in the mountains of Ethiopia and can turn into hyenas. 
this fact has always been a part of my knowledge of the world. Can you talk about the role that these men and hyenas played in your childhood during the mm. Ethiopian revolution? I remember walking down the, the road in front of my grandfather's house with a young man. Uh, in my eyes, he was fully grown, but now when I look back, he might have been in high school, he might have been in college. I believe this was a relative of mine, one of my uncles. It's something that nobody in my family really wants to talk about. So all I have is this hazy image. And he he was somebody that I would often take walks with and I just adored him. And at some point he told me the story of men who turn into hyenas and they live up in the mountains. And of course, as a child, I, I completely believed it. This was true. Um, and then when people started disappearing and when suddenly one day I no longer saw him again, I think in the back of my mind, I said, well, these people are turning, they're turning, they're just disappearing, but that doesn't mean they're not there. I didn't know how to understand exactly what was happening, but I had those memories. Um, and in my child's mind, when, when a child lives in a world where men can turn into hyenas, I think that expands the possibilities and the boundaries of what's possible. And I think in some ways that probably fed into my imagination. Uh, maybe this is why I'm constantly um, interested and intrigued and, and always questioning aspects of conflict throughout history. Because even as a kid, that was, that was part of the world that I grew up in. But within that world, anything could happen. And even these fantastical things that could feasibly save human beings. If these men became hyenas, no one could kill them. So, uh, yeah, and I, you know, even now, um, I know that's not true. But the world, the expansive world still exists in my head. So I was really fascinated by the fact that one of the stories that got submitted um, to us that we published talks about these men who turn into hyenas. There's a reference there. I've had conversations with friends of mine in Somalia and uh, they say, wait a minute, we thought we had that. I said, no, that's ours. <laughs> I think it's a regional thing. And um, I don't know who started it, but there are cultures that truly, you know, that was part of it. That was what they believed, what we believed. Can you talk about your own path from Ethiopia to the United States? It's interesting. We left because my father worked for Ethiopian Airlines and when things started to get really bad, um, he said, we've got to get out. He, he left and my mother followed. I stayed behind with my grandparents. I didn't want to leave right away, but they went to settle in and do these things. And in that period, the revolution started to get really violent and especially in our area. Um, that I really didn't want to leave. I didn't, even knowing what I, even as a kid, what I was beginning to pick up on, I didn't want to leave. But my mother came back at some point and said, we've got to, she needs to get out. And I, I re very reluctantly left um, and went to Nigeria. We stayed there and then went to Kenya. And at that point, the revolution was um, reaching its, its most violent period, the Red Terror. And that's what I write about in my first novel. And it was also in that period that my relatives were disappearing and were being killed. And at some point my mother found out that one of her brothers not only had disappeared, but he was definitely dead. Um, and she just said, I, we've got to get, we've got to get, her out or us out. Ni Nairobi was also full of informers from the government. There were people informing on each other. They were watching my family there, watching things back in, in Ethiopia. And it became really precarious for my, for my parents at some point because of an informant. Um, and I came to the US and, um, you know, a little side story years, years, years later, probably about maybe 10 years ago, um, my father told us when I was on a visit to Ethiopia that the person who informed the government 
back then, the regime who informed on my family in Kenya came to my father and said, I'm dying of cancer, will you forgive me? And to imagine the, the havoc this man raised in our lives, like my life completely changed, my family's life completely changed because of that. And he said, I lied, please forgive me, I'm dying. And my, my father just you know, presented this, didn't know what to do. And I don't think he spoke to him, but I think he said, for, you know, we've lived, we've moved on and you need to, you need to live your life. So that was like an addendum to all of this that that happened. I haven't thought about it in a while. 